So if you've been around this space for a minute, you see a lot of guys. They want to help the world or tell you what you want to hear instead of cleaning their own house. So in all my travels, all my research, there's this one man who personifies this. His name? George Bruno. I wish he had paid attention when we were swapping notes, as his situation is not new or unique. We have a very simple set of strategies that we use to overcome the hardships he rambles on about in this misplaced, impotent helplessness. So in case you can't see the tweet that I'm referencing here, I'll read it out for you. I was in a marriage many years ago where my wife made much more money than I did. Keyword was. Listen up, guys. The stupidest thing a man could ever think is that would never happen to me. So either find a way to increase your income or start stashing now. You're welcome. This advice is outdated, it's simplistic, and it's lacking self-awareness. From a red-pilled lens, this here is everything wrong with modern man. And I'm going to explain why. The assumptions he made here are based on the old set of rules. I mean, this is typical of traditional conservative men. They have these three errant mental models. First one is that once a girl starts bringing home the bacon, the man becomes useless. Second one, most men, when they observe this fact, think that they're exempt from the rules. Third one, that you gotta compete with or mitigate against the women in your life. Who the hell am I to talk? My name's Ryan. I was raised on a ranch, worked in a logging camp, former sailor with the Royal Canadian Navy, also former corporate cog, and currently an entrepreneur with a focus on sexual dynamics and consulting people with their relationship problems. And this is going to be a perfect example of that. I've circumnavigated the globe. I've been surrounded by men who are barely able to be called civilized. It's the ranch, not the globe. I've had a ton of fun with enough women to be good at it, but not so many as to be better than the best at it. And after all this, I've settled down with a girl who recently enjoyed her 11th-ish anniversary with me. In the past five or so years, I've surrounded myself with thousands of other men from all walks of life who have swapped stories and experiences about sexual strategies. Only in this clown world, with this feminine influence, can somebody both make 8 cents more on the dollar and complain about making 30 cents less while holding a straight face. If society was a parent, this would have been them asking their daughter if she had gotten into the cookie jar, and her with crumbs all over her face responded with a very sincere no. Women already bring home the bacon. And if education is still linked to lifetime earnings, and I'm sure it is, that trend is accelerating, not decelerating. So for the average man, this ship has already sailed. While for the above average man, it may not be long when they too are going to miss that port called a harbor traffic. So to treat this situation as untenable is to deny the ability of men to overcome hardship. We have way too many men in our history that have suffered way worse tragedies than we've had here just to give up when Susan gets promoted to director of product distribution. Provision was a key metric for mate choice back when the options were to get a man or get eaten by a bear. Provision was a key metric when the most lucrative job was to have the government fly people down to Europe in order to carpet bomb the fatherland. Provision was a key metric for mate choice back when our choices were to tend the field for 12 hours a day or beat clothing against a rock. Now those days are over. Thank God for that. The secondary metrics were men that provided emotional fulfillment and social proof. And to a lesser extent, the guy that Susan could use as a cudgel to smash her friends with over lunch. So to sit here with a lifetime of advice and admit defeat over the loss of one's responsibility for provision is to admit that one had no other qualities other than being a strong back and the willingness to break it for somebody. The men who came before us didn't have the luxury to navel gaze about their role in society. They were too busy avoiding starvation. Now, had you given any of them the option for freedom? most would have taken it, except those who had nothing else to offer. So because men used to do something out of necessity doesn't mean it's noble to do the same thing out of some feigned obligation. We stopped leeching when we figured out medicine. 
I think we can stop the resurgence of plow horse masculinity now in this age of abundance. I've talked with many, many men over the years. I've talked with men during my time in the Navy. I've been exposed to every demographic of man in this vast country, from the Bay Boys of Newfoundland, to the urbane Torontonian, to the small town prairie boy, to the coastal west coast hippie. All economic quintiles, all parts of the country, healthily supplanted with a bunch of strangers that I'd meet and talk with in foreign ports as diverse as Moscato Man in San Diego, California. No man has ever had the assumption that the rules did not apply to him. In fact, quite the opposite. Most men's insecurities came from the understanding that they were not part of that class of people that levitated above the rest of us. Their concern was not over losing some antiquated identity, but how to create a life story when the one they knew didn't apply. Now, if you read the works of some other red-pilled men, you're going to see that accepting the real rules of engagement was easy. The hard part was how to answer the question. What's the question? We'll get to that. But for now, as author Ian Ironwood put it, here's his response to a comment left behind on his post about wife tests. The goal of a red pill marriage is not how to get your wife back into the kitchen where she belongs, as the well-intentioned poster seems to think. The goal is how to effectively and efficiently run a family in a way that provides the most secure happiness for everybody. The male-dominant method is the most proven and reliable, so that's the one we adopt. Pill also recognizes that if marital power is realized in terms of economic power, as feminism accepts, then the current trend of wives out earning their husbands are going to lead to an undermining of the successful male and female dynamic required for stable and successful marriages under the current beta-building feminist ideology. I kind of like how it refers to that. So we answer this issue by abandoning economic input as the factor by which dominance in a relationship is established. So this here, this is why I've always had that level of disdain for those tradcon guys. They're like the masculine equivalent of seeing an eight-year-old girl in a wedding dress. I mean, sure, all the right parts are there, but as an image, it's just wrong. So to observe the modern sexual marketplace, it's giving very clear indicators that women crave dominance and continue to become an economic powerhouse. You can also observe that feminism, or the idea that women are equal to men, but more equal than most. It's using a short-term animal house form of equality without concern or understanding for the long-term implications. So Ian continues to enlighten us with a personal anecdote. For years, Mrs. Ironwood was in a career that provided far more income than mine. Once she became established in her profession, she was making twice what I was. And in our blue pill days, that was a serious issue. Why? Because we both assumed that since she made more money in our equal partnership, that she should be invested with most of the economic power and make most of the financial decisions in our marriage. Since I was the weaker economic factor, I guiltily yielded both power and responsibility. She didn't want either. I didn't feel empowered to take a leadership position, and she didn't feel empowered to ask me to. So we plodded along unhappily for years. Now, once I gave up worrying about who made more money and I got off my ass and led my family, it did not matter. As long as she meets the basic requirements we agreed upon when we married, that stable, predictable income, she can be a neurologist or sell Mary Kay, and I'm not going to let that interfere with my responsibility as a husband or a father. Or how I hold her to account as a mother or a wife. Not because of any silly ideal, not because of a religious commandment, misguided machismo, but because the praxeology of this states that heterosexual relationships in which the male leads with unapologetic dominance are the most successful. Now, I understand that Bruno was divorced around 12 years ago, and most of this stuff is like 6 to 10 years old, so it came too late to save him from Susan, destroyer of worlds. However... Since that time, he was accepted graciously into this loosely organized sphere of men, the only entrance requirement being that one has a grievance and the will to solve it publicly so others can benefit from your solution. So to see this old man sitting at the bar, giving advice to young men in between his whiskey hiccups that so missed the mark, makes me believe that he had no intention of overcoming his grievance. Misery loves company, 
And this man's misery loved the idea of a clubhouse of men in a dimly lit room having fight club-esque testicular cancer meetings and consoling each other. Constantly reassuring themselves that yes, they are still men. I mean, there's something about the way Palinchuk wrote that bit about men missing their testicles and consoling each other. I disagree with Bruno that a man is concerned about being the exception. It is much more likely that this man is very aware of the dynamics of the new modern society and seeks to answer the question, I don't bring home the bacon, what good am I to a woman? To which we had figured out almost a decade ago. The answer was to bring dominance to the role of her as a man and tap into her limbic brain needs to be led. And this is the part that inspired me to write this. A lifetime of experience, a man who was thrown into the meat grinder, brought up with a group of like-minded men and shown a better way, and this here, this is the takeaway he gives to the new generation of men? I am not impressed. He should know better. And if he doesn't know better, there was a hundred guys who were happily gonna help him. So in this rush to earn that one dollar above parity, or to scavenge enough cash to pass muster, it screams two things to me. Insecurity and competition. Pickup artists, of which many guys who call themselves Red Pill had come from originally, remember there's two rules. Be attractive, don't be unattractive. And in that we came up with some concepts. Displays of higher value and displays of lower value. These were used to describe qualities and actions to ensure that you were staying as attractive as possible and not sabotaging yourself. Point is, I can think of nothing lower value than not only saying that this woman is your competition, that you guys are equal, but that she's actually beating you. And expressing that not even through your words, but through your actions. Any woman who's being honest with herself loves having a man by her side that she looks up to. Any woman who is skilled at being a good woman compartmentalizes her job with her home life. Any woman who is worth a damn does not treat money as panty wetness. Now a man who has no game will destroy all three of those very attractive mental models by looking at her pay stub while he's sweating profusely. Women do not need a man anymore. But that's not to say women don't want one. Women who haven't suffered too much trauma in their lives, they want men. They always have, they always will. Women also don't want to starve, they don't want to be eaten by wolves, and they don't want to be thought of poorly by their friends. Now our forefathers worked themselves to the bone to make a world where man-eating wolves are extinct and food is plentiful. So what's left? It's the need to make her look up to somebody and to look down on her friends for not getting to you first. You're no longer a commodity, you're a luxury item. And this is the most wonderful role to give a man today. And guys like Bruno are throwing it away because what? They would rather leave their money on the dresser every two weeks than undress her in the way she wants them to? Aw oh, man. I was always irritated when I would hit a foreign port. And this is why I stopped drinking at the bar that was next to the ship. When you would go to the bar and some old chief alcoholic would just start dumping his life story onto you as a cautionary tale. So we've reached the point that that's become a viable business strategy. Do not buy into this doom and gloom story from old men who refuse to let go of their fantasy of men being men, women being women, and Norman Rockwell paintings of Americana being historical fact. Yeah, life was brutish, short, and hard. People did what they had to do to survive, and that's including sleeping with the hand that fed them. Luckily for everybody, those days are over, and not soon enough. So your job if you choose to have it, is to fulfill that role that no globalized economy can outsource, that role that no wife can supplant with her income, that role that no cat can act as a surrogate for. Your job is to be a dominant, charming, and charismatic man who handles his family regardless of income and looks good while doing it. And to ignore the men who yell at clouds. So on that note, I wanna thank you guys for listening. Feel free to subscribe if you like this content. I do tons more videos. Hit that notification icon. And I'll catch you guys in the podcast on Saturday. Cheers.